Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very glad to be here for um, Satya's book. Um, although, um, you know, there is a schism right here between any attempt to, uh, to speak um, on the book and, and, and the book itself, which is, which is a work of such magnitude. Um, and anyone would just be you know, too honored to comment on such a work, um, given the dogmatic image of thought of our times. Uh, given that they are geared towards the politics of antagonism. Um, Satya is, I mean, I, he needs to introduce him, he's a gifted scholar, um, who spills off the last year when Mudra uh, gestures to that which, is, which presents itself as, and in his own words, the ethical legislative phantasm of thought, um, and which uh, ultimately institutes itself as the law. Uh, now, just a sovereignty that um, lurking at the heart of what Satya critiques as potentiality without actuality, or the very impossibility of thinking actuality as such, and which is which informs a large part of his work. Um, instead, Satya, speaking of the political theology of Schelling, posits um, as the actuality without potentiality, which releases thought from its predestinal authority or potency, as as everybody here is already kind of the, you know, directed to us. Um, this being uh, without sovereignty which Satya is, is trying to uh, recharge uh, is then released from its normative obligations and which he terms as a tragic hegemony uh, where the differential potencies of thought and being uh, have to give up, let's say, their unifying potentiality uh, resulting in uh, not the, uh, like the theodicity of history as we see in Hegel uh, but brings the different to speak and bring the scission, as uh, Satya says, into themselves to give up being as such. Uh, now, I mean, uh, given these signs, I mean, it, is, it becomes even more uh, of a task uh, to make being give up its own predestinal image of thought. Um, and here, uh, Satya brings about a very important uh, turn, let's say, in in sharing, which is to uh, talk of the giving up of potency, God as impotent, uh, religion uh, not as how we imagine religion in, in the image of thought to be, but religion as in its religiosity. Right? And this is uh, this is something that Deleuze also, uh, like Shomura has also pointed out, Deleuze in difference and repetition, um, in speaking of sharing, can also talk about as uh, as Schelling bringing out difference out of the night of the identical. Right? So that what Schelling therefore does is to is to bring difference um, to the fore, right? And and to not posit a, a transcendence after that, but to in delusion terms, let's say, to posit an imminence of that difference. Uh, now there are two tendencies of what uh, in Schelling and and I, I um, have no prior um, intimacy with or familiarity with Shelley. I mean, it is mainly uh, Satya's work which, which uh, brought me to uh, Shelley. Um, so as, as much as I could understand, uh, it seems that there is a turn in Shelley himself, uh, which one can refer to as his middle period, and where he uh, writes these two important essays, uh, the treatise on human freedom, which he wrote in 1809, and uh, the agents of the world, uh, the, the world daughter, the uh, written and in 1811 or so. Um, and where Shelley himself turns from a uh, kind of transcendental philosophy of consciousness to uh, what we call, uh, what one could call a nature philosophy, or uh, later, I mean, where he is influenced by Spinoza, but later where he also uh, differentiates that also. Um, and so, uh, for Deleuze, uh, speaking on uh, Shelley, he finds that there is a that the imminence that, that Shelley brings forth uh, is, a, is, is a kind of a radical incommensurability um, of, the, of the conditions with uh, which that they themselves condition. Right? So there is a transcendental aporia, and which is at the crux, which is at the heart of Shelley's work. Right, that there is that that there is an inability of the absolute with itself. Right? So Shelley posits an incommensurability, a schism, a division within the absolute itself, where the absolute is not
not identical with itself. And therefore, it is always already given as difference to itself. Right? And therefore, it is neither nature nor consciousness. But one could say that it is it is it takes the form of let's say an absolute indifference. Right? It is not uh, it is not nature itself, it is not given as nature itself, it is not given as consciousness itself, but as an indifference which is geared towards freedom. Right? And that I think makes makes up for uh, a major part of, of Satya's uh, idea of sharing, which is the, uh, the necessity of freedom. Right? And, and I think there is a there's a very uh, beautiful uh, line that uh, that really caught my attention. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to uh, look for it. Where um, uh, Satya writes, uh, the necessity of freedom is freedom's own most necessity itself. Right? And this is this is what is being arrived at in Shalim's work. Right? The, 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 to think not of necessity, not of freedom as necessity, but to think of freedom as a setting apart and, and to think of freedom in the eschaton, to think of freedom in the exception, but which does not bring forth its own uh, discourse, its own uh, destination. Right? So, uh, and therefore, to think of this absolute will, let's say, uh, as irreducible to the choices that can be exercised by any given subject. Right? So there is the will, therefore, cannot be reduced. It is the irreducible remainder, right, that that persists and and cannot be made part of the known. Um, and therefore, here the what we understand then is that instead of this antagonistic uh, distinction that, that, we, that we find uh, between the world and the is and the not is, the world and, and the not world, um, instead of that antagonism then one has to maintain what Satya also terms the agonal distance, right? The distance which um, between freedom and necessity, between criticism and dogmatism. Right? If we sublate that difference, we return to that ethical legislative fantasy. Right? We constantly that it is a Nietzschean return of the same. Right? And Deleuze then in, he, he brings back Nietzschean and says, can we endure that kind of world? Can we endure the world as it is, as it is returned to us? Right? So then one has to retain that infinite opening uh, to the internet, uh, to retain the caesura of God. And this is Schelling's, uh, you know, great uh, uh, gift as it were uh, to, to, uh, to Occidental uh, metaphysics itself, right? Uh, to, to bring the caesura back into, into uh, practice, uh, into the practice of metaphysics, into the practice of thought itself. Um, and therefore, um, and I'll not uh, take up much time now, I mean, uh, in the last chapter, Satya talks about uh, the tragic hero, and he talks about the singularization of the tragic hero, um, and where that hero becomes uh, heroic um, at the moment of the declaration of the known. Because the hero is already uh, being punished uh, by his own tragic destiny. Uh, to which he cannot, uh, which he cannot escape, but to which he can only declare a, a no, a very, a very uh, strident declaration of the no. And this we find, uh, let's say, in in, uh, uh, in Prometheus, in Sisyphus, right? But where freedom is, the, the tragic hero is mocked by freedom because of that declaration of no. And I would just like to, uh, you know, just just read out from. Um, uh, Satya's own work. Um, this is from the last uh, chapter uh, of his book on tragic dissonance. Um, and when he says, the tragic hero here does not sacrifice himself in order to be reconciled voluntarily with the nomothetic order of the law, nor does he constitute himself as a sovereign exceptional being as the subject that returns to itself as a master of free will. 
Here, though the situation and the response to it take place in a different context to that of the mysticism of the law, the tragic hero is atoned not in the sense of being reconciled with the objective order of necessity in the form of fate, but rather in the sense that he declares at all. Even at the last moment of his existence, the event of language that affirms the freedom to say no. It is this declaring itself, this event of uttering itself, even when one is silent, that singularizes him at this indiscernible instance of the taking place of death. The tragic hero Oedipus is singularized by his mortality and duly abandons the juridical legislative nexus of the world. The rule of the world is here neither minimized nor made bearable by the event of declaring the more of refusal, but is rather intensified to the utmost instance of an occurrence in which the life of the tragic being touches death. At this indiscernible moment, he is neither of particular subsumable under the universal order of the law, nor is he assuming the name of universality himself as the sovereign government. He loses his entitative attribute predicated mode of being in the world and is exposed to the event of breathing in on him as the singular being through which the language of declaration passes as an event. Here, free will is not something that belongs to the tragic hero as a property. It is that through which the singular being occurs to Oedipus as an event. And one need not uh, look too far to see how this declaration of the norm is taking place. Thank you. Thank you very much. I guess we can probably go to 10 minutes or so in a very fast read. I'll just try to read fast Millen's uh, uh, response. And it's sad that he was to make it himself, but I'll just uh, try to make up for it by reading. So this is what Millen has to say. Millen, as you know, he is an IIT Delhi and he is quite well known uh, uh, in or center otherwise, but let me just read. Satyavada Das's passion and intensity as a scholar and philosopher is easily seen in the fine filigree of his prose. At each moment, one gets the sense of a kind of pulsion, as though he was straining to break through the limitations of academic presentation, leaning over into something akin to messianic fervor, even if he is only pointing to the possibility of that abyss that crossroad, that rift with B, in order to give us a sense of the good beyond B. But that too, really only in transit, in a kind of perduring evanescence. In work of such seriousness of purpose, one is always moved to ask, what are the conditions of possibility of such an overreaching? What ensures that there is already at the level of language a crossing through? What guarantees that insistent, unrelenting crossing over to earth. Sakti is the real philosopher for whom the hour of this breaking, of this breaking through, is immeasurably more important than the short-lived gains of political or theoretical polemic. To be sure, he's an inspiring teacher. As I learned, after evaluating an outstanding empathy circuit ball supervised by him, Toilet as a researcher, feel the matter's command over the shelling corpus. He's an ardent and loyal friend. But in the transverse to these commitments in everyday being together with others, he is as a philosopher uniquely and determinately recluse. Here I have in mind something like the figure of Nietzsche's Dionysius. For Satyas, it's the realist of philosophical gestures in that it points to something untimely in the realm of figurality, in the domain of that which is to come. Again, this is a marked feature of his messianical apocalyptic prose, which seems to reach out to learn something against the night sky, but in a fashion that comes closer to that of the diviner. There is a meaning of the figure constellated in that sky does and frame. But we must perhaps wait for many more of Satya's books before the silhouette emerges. In the meantime, I am in no hurry to discern any familiar presence in the shapes of thought that it does provide. No post-colonial, no post-Christian, no dialectician, certainly not the Dalit of academicized Dalit studies. I am in no hurry as I turn happily and contentedly to read him. For Satya, 
I learned to read. For the rift that this language seeks to traverse is more than a covenant, exceeding the return to itself of the concept by the perpetual internal dissension of polemology, and much more than a theology or a messianicism attuned to questions of historicity. In short, Satya's thought seeks to surpass at once Hegel and Heidegger. This explains the elective ability, understanding the phrase in the crypto messianic sense that Goethe gave it, and that Benjamin taught us to appreciate. This explains the elective affinity with Shelley. Satya's engagement with that philosopher takes place at a level of absorption, which far exceeds anything Heidegger may have meant and achieved his own engagements with philosophers such as Nietzsche and Shelley. You will recall that in each of those instances, Heidegger tries to push the wayward course of these highly original trajectories towards something like a condensation with his own. Heidegger is always a historian of philosophy, which is to say, a historian of the history of philosophy, as he sees it, as it can only ever be for him, the history of the oblivion of the question of being. Now, had Satya undertaken a reading of Schelling along these lines, he would have generated a positive account of Schelling's later positive philosophies, but only so long as he could have shown that it succumbed in the end to the need to take for granted the relation between essence and existence. He could well have argued along Heideggerian lines that the question of ground in Schelling remains unaddressed, that what the grounds the that what grounds the ground is an idea of substance or hypokaimen that remains unexamined and so on. Instead, what we do have here is Satya's shedding book. Let us read an illustrative passage. And Milim quotes that I read, this is from the book. So Satya says, At the closure of negative philosophy, positive philosophy has to begin again. Without a foundation and groundless between them, as it were, there is inside a hold, a bringing to a standstill of reason, a momentary paralysis of the law. The entire movement of the worldly nomos is, as it were, brought to momentary nothing, the Algen blink. This absolute eschatological moment actualizes the passing of nomos and inaugurates a new world. The momentary nothing is the sublime instance of history. There was never more than one beginning in Schellingian philosophy. The second beginning is not merely an indifferent and quantitative revolution of the first, but it is a differential revolution, a bringing forth of difference as difference out of the night of the identical. This sublime event of history will no longer allow itself to be included with the predicted structure of speculative history. In the post Schellingian era, philosophy will have to begin with the unprethinkable event, which, as groundless priors, opens up a limitless and infinite thinking without closure. Unquote. Once back to Millen's text. In the movement of his thinking, Satya virtually recaps and rehearses Shelley's own typical inauguration of a positive philosophy. Satya's feat acquires its significance from the fact that Shelley's corpus after 1809, which saw the publication of his free ties of freedom, is marked by a series of inaugurations, movements, openings, apertures, and so on, each announcing yet again the inaugural, or as one might say, after Heidegger, inceptual nature of the very movement of thought. For Shelley's thought increasingly saw itself as the institution of a beginning as a setting in place of a new priors that no longer work its way from out of either the self-reference of the self, as in Krishna, or the self-reference of the negative, as in Hegel, but in fact try to imagine the metaphysical cosmogony of a new beginning from the standpoint of positivity itself. A metaphysical cosmogony derived, as Satya untiringly reminds us, from what Shelley characterized as the urgent need for a metaphysical empiricism. What emerges from the institution at the outset or at the beginning is the fact of this inception, which also entails a historic break with German idealism. I will not pretend that the latter phrase German idealism is easy to understand. Certainly, intellectual historians such as Weiser have taught us nothing about what this phrase means. 
only recently with the publication in English of Gita Heinrich's 1974 lectures are we beginning to get a sense of this difficulty. German idealism is not merely a set of philosophical trajectories clapped together by sheer accident of historical contemporaneity. Already in the Fichte of 1794, and in some sense already in the precocious shelling of those years, the fundamental lines of rupture are beginning to appear in the realm of subjectivity. Lines that will sink deeper into the ground and produce the rift design that is Shelley's corpus after 1809. One might go so far as to say that the philosophical gestures of Hegel and Schaeger, Hegel and Shelley, are so closely intertwined for the following two decades that one could think of a Hegel Shelley, I mean Hegel Shelley, as an entity bearing its own topographical complexities in the German scene of the time. Like a city forgotten in time and discernible only by a satellite imaging, this tremendous underground network, that's the Hegel Shelley network, is not something one can gaze at in a leisurely fashion, sipping coffee in a Weimar cafe. <laughs> at the same time, what is increasingly certain in Shelley's lectures after 1820 on the philosophy of mythology and of revelation is that a clear break with Hegel is in order. In force is inexorable. The after echo of this break can be heard in two moments, one from 1929 and the other from 1937. The first is what precipitates a break with a young Eugene Fink with his teachings of his preceptor Russell. The immediate cause of Fink's enthusiastic participation in Heidegger's lecture course on German idealism in that period, and which gave rise in the long run to a sixth Cartesian meditation. The second movement refers us to the forced retroactive conspectus that Heidegger provides us in his esoteric text, Contributions to Philosophy, where he asks once again a question that can really only be asked after Shelley, and that today we can ask after Satya. <laughs> Which is to say, the exact relation between the idea of the subject in German idealism on the one hand and the historical destiny of Christianity in the modern period on the other is other. It is in this, these moments that we can gain the import of what, as Satya shows us, Schelling's break with Hegel means for us. It's a matter then of breaking with self-reference of the self as well as the self-reference of the negative. But it's also a matter of breaking with Christianity as the harbinger of all good, as the guarantor of all future messianicity, so to speak. And this is at this precise point that we can see how Satya's book is of enormous moment for us. For Satya, at every point, refuses to theologize the question of the subject, just as it takes care at every juncture to avoid subjectivizing the logic of the eschaton. Why I read Satya with such gratitude is thus patently clear. He instructs us to think the subject from out of the notion of historicity. And he teaches us to think futurity from out of the internal tribulations of dogma. A non-messianic eschatology. A non-subjective existentiality. To live as a modern after reading Satya is to live in this strange non-place where the subject is no longer the ground for reason and the future is no longer guaranteed by ontotheology. We live and wait for this future. But as I have tried to indicate above, we do not know what it is. And yet what points towards that future is the positivity of a new departure, a new inception. Satya is then the thinker of this unprethinkable future. And this further is in preserving, harboring, holding this promise open, comes through in his work as a whole. Comes through in his work as a whole, I think. I <laughs> emphasize on whole rather wrongly. Uh, beyond the internal institutes of the concept and the continuing insistence of the passion, Satya enables us to inhabit what he calls the sublimity of this moment. The momentary nothing is the sublime instance of history wherein one is poised on the threshold of futurality itself. A quiet moment, a pensive moment, but those who have heard him laugh will say, Satya will think, see this through. <laughs> but, right, so now we could have some questions, we do have some time.
questions addressed to uh, Shomu and Sandhya, but to Sathya also. And he could also kind of connect to Dilan somehow and virtually ask him questions, if any, on his right time. But further questions, let us have a second round of discussion. And questions could be addressed to Sathya too. Yes. I would not take example from uh, the Gauza Black Man of the it's, it's become too risky these days. So, uh, calling Marx as a eschatological in relation to economic determinism, there are few words that I thought in presentation while uh, <coughs> presenting this book by itself. As divinity versus divinity, political versus theological, myth versus religion, as he was saying that religion is a difference. So my direct question as uh, Shomus, the Shomus uh, said, shedding a shadow of hell. So I am able to somehow uh, think of triangular, Hegel, shedding and Marx. But still, when uh, after listening on the shedding, I think does shedding uh, propose or suggest, it's a very directly, <laughs> I'm posing this question quite a bit, does shedding suggest you have a religion in the most to the political in this state. How should we think? Should we collect a few questions? Can you repeat the last yeah, yeah, sure. Ultimately, at the end of it, does shedding somehow endorse religion as a means of doing the political? That's the crux of the question. Okay. Should we collect a few questions and then all three of yeah, you can yeah. respond from them? Yes, you got your question raised your hand. Maybe you can respond to this question and that may generate a few more questions. We will use this time. Religion to do politics or something? Can you again read it? Yeah, sure. I will repeat the question. Please read the question. While you were listening to the presentation, I could make some picture in my mind. So just scribbling those thoughts in my page. That was like when you presented Mars as uh, as to, uh, saying that eschatological and uh, not in more into relation with economic determinism than dealing king versus reading king in terms of religion and myth and all these things. So basically I am thinking that should we like does Shelley suggest to have a religion to endorse to the political in fact to have a, a religion of the state state religion no. per se. Is Christian thing that he has Unlike uh, Hegel, people like Haman and Bader uh, and uh, Shelley, they are Christian thinkers and he calls himself a Christian philosopher. Could he extend that uh, when he was instituted in the chair, which was created by Hegel's death? Uh, the conservative forces uh, wanted to use Shelley, uh, you know, uh, as a kind of, wanted to pause Shelley as a kind of conservative. You know, this is what Edgar wrote to Marx that uh, they are trying desperately to use something as a kind of conservative thinker to against that. Uh, but uh, it is not so. Well, it's, not. it's a Christian thinker, yes, but there is a deconstruction of religion within itself. In that way, Hickegaard is very, very close to, much more closer to selling than Marx. Because Marx's deconstruction of religion is, in a way, from what you can, what you can say, outside. No? Uh, while Kierkegaard's Christianity without Christian now is very very similar to uh, Selingian deconstruction of uh, Christianity. So it is not a use of religion as a legitimizing for a certain political goal, but a thinking of religion as a delegitimizing of any political sovereignty. Right? So in that way, there is something that is used following Karl Barth that nowadays many theologians following the dialectical theory, they call it theological politics. Maybe it's something like that. You know, it is to think of religion. Uh, uh, what I'm trying to do is to take seriously Marxist critique of religion. Right? But at, at the same time, I'm trying to think religion in a new way. That's a kind of thing. See? Uh, to how to think of religion without religion. <laughs> it's paradoxical way of putting it. 
putting it. Religion and then religion. This is what I also made a distinction between uh, between religion and religion, religion in the sense of religiosity. This is the term that precisely uh, Selling uses in 1804 as a called philosophy and religion. He coins this term uh, religiosity, uh, which is to be distinguished from religion as a mythic concept. So we must be able to distinguish, we must be able to introduce a separation within the heart of religion itself in such a way that uh, uh, it is in such a way that uh, maybe you uh, can think of a religious deconstruction of religion. In that way, this is what Christianity itself is in Selinkan interpretation. In the, in the uh, uh, Selinkan interpretation, religion, Christianity means all the time going out of the world. But this opening of the world, opening out of opening of the world which outside is not opening from another another world. See? So from the heart of the world, religion opens up to something that is outside the world, but it is not to another world in turn. What do you think of that outside? According to my friend Son Hydra, it is separated for a bit is not. I not like the name. I don't yet have a name. It's maybe I, I have tried to call it something like religion to come. So maybe very does type of democracy to come. It's a religion to come. Okay? Religion by definition which is future. Which is also the term of eschatology. Which is not a particular future, but future that is politically future. And future anterior. Which is in a way also unpeachable, even before thinkable, even before past. The past before past, which is also in that way a future after any future. In that way, it is outside eternity. That's it. No, of course, but I would say for him also, panelists could respond potentially. No, it's good. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's Uh, this is early, uh, I would say. 
So in, in universes, that event, which is uh, where life touches death, which is neither life nor death, where pure life is released in a way, plus of life, pure life is released uh, from what we call bad life, from the inscripted life, from the life under the devil. That an option of the releasing of the pure life in that event between life and death, which is unhumanable, which is, which is also uh, what I call sublime in of history. This is also the effect of history. So, in that way, it is not pure negotiation, but it's also pure harmless. So, it is the uh, impoverishment of the power of the Jupiter because he is going to die anyway, but it is also at the same time pure harmless. So pure. Outside, apart from some without power. But in that way, it also exceeds all power. In that way, it may be even more powerful than power. More powerful than power. There is still to go there, but that's a, before that's a little bit. So there is an absolute aside, I'm sure this is absolutely aside. In Greek, the word for no is okay, and the word for yes is me. So, purely ironic. <laughs>
you make, make that actually a major point about uh, differentiating between a, a daily investment in the uh, patients associated with the concept and uh, something which is different in the case of shape. And in one case, I saw you uh, mark that shaping preoccupation as a kind of language thinking, as different from concept thinking. So I wanted to hear a bit more about that. Like we know that in Kegel there is a discussion of language in close proximity to the concept in many places, like in um, the philosophy of mind, which uh, later on Derrida commented on the kitchen that they are for instance where the meaning is something which is entered and which is taken out, etc. A specific kind of life or death of uh, uh, the spirit which appears there. Now, what, what is actually, is there a kind of different way of looking at language and shape? So, this possibility is kind of indicated there, and maybe it is taken up later on. So, this is one question. And, and the second question probably is a stupid question because uh, that is a major theme in your book and I'm sure that you come back to that many times in the book. That is about the status of the term religion. Because um, you know, we often make a distinction between religion and something which we do not quite want to identify with religion, but which we want to retain something of religion or given the kind of penumbra of religion. Sometimes people call it the religious, etc. Et uh, what exactly is the necessity of it? What is it that makes it necessary for you to turn to a religion to come rather than a secular to come? Is a secular to come an impossibility? So I just wanted to you know, bring it out just to hear your response. Thank you. Uh, I uh, think uh, uh, the importance of studying uh, for the post study and thought, the reception of studying, one of the reception of studying is by Kierkegaard and the reasons why, uh, which interests me much more than the Marxist, uh, Marxist appropriation of it. Marxists more often than Engels, Engels have very nasty things to say about studying. Uh, so, uh, so, one problem, uh, one uh, uh, thing that both Kierkegaard and Rosalind's wife focuses on. This is what, what I also follow, and I'm uh, inserting myself in that constellation of thinkers. Is uh, the question of language, mm -hmm. uh, the question of language, uh, languages event, uh, or the necessity of thinking of existence without concept. Uh, existence without concept, uh, and there is a uh, how to say it? In, 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 in Salinian thought, uh, Salin says that in Hegelian thought, uh, Hegelian thought can be best termed as negative philosophy. In negative philosophy is a kind of infinite return of the potentials. You see? And where the potentials or the potencies are uh, like uh, you have potency A, A1, A2, and then the circle closes, then another circle opens up, and so on and so forth. This never ending vicious circle of the return of the potencies. Why? It is necessary to think, it is important to think, the event of freedom that breaks this circle of potencies. And that's the idea of actually. The moment you introduce the idea of actually, you immediately pause the question of time and the question of history. So, the, in order to understand the question of the event of language, it is important to think the relationship between time and language and language and history. Uh, uh, for example, in, uh, in, in if you take up Hegel's logic, the beginning of Hegel's logic, uh, he has to begin without presupposition, right? Uh, so. He has to begin, he cannot begin with particular, particular being. So he has to begin with a being which is also no being. So being is equal to nothing and nothing is equal to being. You can refer the order and you can say meaning. So nothing is equal to, and then you have synthesis, being passing into nothing, nothing passing into being is becoming. So you get priority. And from that it is, uh, you know, selling has a beautiful analogy in relation to 
you know, uh, meet in Indian talks. In the Bali, there is a king Bali or Bali or Bali. Bali, you know, yeah. And one of the avatars of Bali, oh, 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 avatars of uh, Vishnu, came as a Brahman or Brahman boy who wanted three pieces of land, little three pieces. And then uh, he was very, you know, prosperous, very strong, powerful king. He said, okay, fine, only three pieces of land. So he put one foot on the earth, another foot on the sky, and there is no place for the third, third uh, uh, foot. So it is like in Hegelian logic also works like that. This is clear <laughs> video. That he asked little thing. He asked for you, grant this being is nothing. Okay, you grant it. And you said that nothing is being. <laughs> then you grant it. And then the third foot becomes so big, so immense, that the whole system is constructed. But the thing is, is that what is denied in Hegel's logic is the question of the event. The concept by definition cannot think of the event. Because it cannot think of actuality or existentiality or reality, whatever they mean. Right? So this pan logicism of uh, which is the foundation, ontological foundation of Hegel's system, and Hegel grounds philosophy of history on ontology. It cannot really think of the event. And because concept is the quintification of the, the uh, singularity of what outside the concept outside the universal. So therefore, one, uh, to introduce the exception to that panologism is to think of language as a man which cannot be subsumed under the concept. You see? So all these things are connected. Language in relation to time, for example, in relation to the other, where language selling uh, things language not basically as multiplicity subsumable under the universal. Right? Well, this is what concept does. This is what the concept does. Concept subdues multiplicity under the universal. Uh, what uh, selling thinks of language as like an address to the other, where there is an opening up of time. So between I say something and the other responds, and if we, I don't know what response will come from the other. You see, so there is an incalculability of the uh, other's response. And which is also opening up of the future. The response which is future, which is incalculable, which is unpredictable, unprethinkable, and so and so forth. And this opens up the whole question of the history. Uh, so in that way, according in Selenian interpretation, that I guess philosophy of history is really not history, historical. We really have to think of historical outside the philosophy of history. That's what, and then that means that we have to think language. Another question? Really, I don't like the word secular. <laughs> yeah, because the word seculum means the word uh, means seculum. The word secular means world, world. And I think it is necessary necessary to think uh, outside the world because the idea of the world is constantly bound up to the question of the human legitimacy of the human. You see. Uh, Religion I like to use, but again I have used there for a lot of adjectives to define, redefine, to say that see it is not really the religion as we understand it to be. It is religion up. It is not enclosed religion. It is a provisional gesture, insufficient gesture. But if better term comes then I'll abandon it. Like who gets thanks letter. You know, use the concept as as you climb up the letter and then when you find it useless, you throw it. So I don't I don't have particular investment in the word. Even Selim himself uses many words. He uses religiosity. He doesn't use religion. He in fact contrasts religion against religiosity. He says that to be faithful to Selim, we should have religiosity, not so much religion. As a denomination. Religiosity without denomination. Semantic weight, the current semantic weight of the word religion is such as that uh, a very deep archaeological, etymological recovery of the religio, as you put it, must uh, be done. But Francis has a question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Is that okay? Huh? Yes. Um, no, thank you for this uh, great work and uh, the discussion you had here with uh, Sophia. Uh, and others. And 
I read last part of the book of the book of the book. I should first of all say, I didn't go to the actual say, I was always afraid of you. <laughs> afraid of you. Having grown up in a yeah, having grown up in a very rigid Western religious context. Theology always frightened me, and I always uh, took a long step away from it. And even now I would rather do that. And, uh, but then I see the logic, I, I, I see the historical situation in which uh, theology has made a major impact. And uh, I know about it uh, less from the 19th century, because of the Republic's uh, early in my uh, first half of the 19th century, the Republic's, but uh, more in terms of Nietzsche and Levinas. And uh, now, um, uh, now you mentioned a key, now two things I should mention here, uh, the stage of one is the connection between uh, Heidegger and uh, Schemming. And this is extremely difficult for me to go along Because uh, from what I can understand, they, can, they cannot be two plus one classes in the side of the Heidegger uh, and Schemming. Um, and for the reasons we see like this. Um, and you also mentioned this key uh, term or key phrase from uh, um, from uh, Levinas. Uh, in fact, you, uh, you, you see and understand sharing in terms of Levinas here uh, uh, not to be able to uh, not to be able to be able uh, uh, the, the lack of ability uh, that's a certain problem you know, in Levinas uh, not to be able to be able to uh, in Levinas in very strong this is the old idea. This is what leads to the old idea of passivity and so on, both in the Levinas and in and, and, and Russia, Russia in such a big way. Uh, now, uh, now, when one speaks of uh, actuality without potentiality, two things seem to appear there. One is uh, the idea of potentiality in terms of time, which is probably what Seems to take potentiality in relation to Heidegger. Heidegger is the early one of Heidegger is quite strongly connected to the problem of time. And uh, the other uh, uh, is uh, 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 in case. So if you take this, um, yeah, one is the potentiality of time, another is problematic of power. And now uh, I am able to think that, I tend to think that potentiality here has so much to do with power. And uh, to me it seems the kind of the construction of power that's happening here is not adequate. Right? It's rather weak. Uh, I mean, this is our private seat, our private seat of property. Yeah? If you're not be able to be able to this, this absolute ability, you know, and that's, that means uh, against power. You know, that's what we are not questions. And uh, so, therefore, mm, uh, there's a very strong sense of but in, in going away from Hegel and others at that point of time, more Hegel and less Marx, it is the questioning of uh, the world of one kind or the other, the secular world or the divine world or the religious world, uh, in terms of the part, questioning of that. And so therefore, to me, it seems to me that the actuality without uh, potentiality is concerned with the weakening or uh, enfeeblement of the world, of the world of man and so on. And of course, today is very difficult to speak of enfeeblement and empowerment uh, and weakening and so on. And most of the lot of contemporary to us will deal with this problem. Passivity, disempowerment, uh, disempowerment, weakening uh, and so on. And, uh, uh, and therefore, um, but so therefore, when we begin to talk about political theory, 
Even when Prabhu uses the expression by Buddhism theology in the context of Shedding, it is a political theology from which one has to be constantly researched and not have the power maintained with it. Because uh, if you just desire that power, then, uh, then you can't exist. Um, this is putting it very harshly. Yeah, right. uh, I see two more hands and I fear, I mean, I, uh, I, I will hope and fear that both the Christian philosophy are similar direction, therefore we can take the questions together. Babu, and where is the other? Yeah, right. And then you can respond at one point. These two the two last and final questions from the other day. Yes. Alright. So, I just uh, want to tell you uh, duration by reading your book. This thought of quickly. Uh, and uh, how it would be that Satya invited by a few monasteries where they teach theories, but they teach theology differently. You know, the Carmelites, the Dominican, the Franciscan, the Jesuits, or maybe Bible, where, you know, most of the work that they're doing uh, actually originated there. Heidegger, Kazan, and Martin, and all of them. And I'm sure, and I'm afraid, it would be an escatol, and it will end up in the next, in the kind of uh, incalculable uh, end. It's very interesting. Uh, uh, I just want to I guess, uh, point out on a very simple aspect, you know, and based on the history of Christianity and based on the liturgy, based on the uh, ordinary faith, how it was before. So, till the modernity, so the, the rule of medieval classicism and the Benedictian principles. So the Benedict, faith Benedict defined almost all the principles uh, for the monastic, monastic orders. Uh, mainly it is pray and work. Ora is the Bola. Yeah? And uh, work for the Benedictines was the uh, labor, that is the uh, agriculture, so how they were the whole agriculture in Europe. But the Ola is very important. Uh, it's in fact more important than the work. And the difference between the Mora Ola before the morality and after morality. And before that it was a play, I won't say without hope, it's uncertain. Yeah. So uh, there is hope and somehow coupled with a, an uncertainty. You don't know what it will become. That not missed was the most there. So uh, and that is reflected in the most famous prayer in Christianity. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But we don't know what it is. So that uncertainty and what happened with Descartes first, you know, philosophically, has to be replaced with certainty. And with Luther, again in a different way, that order became again work. The work is worship, the Lutheran uh, principle. So it, and it became a demonstrable work. I won't say taking a work with certainty, but still there's more certainty. I mean, working towards something rather than just praying. And that is there in all, everywhere in capitalism and Protestantism to influence each other. And from Freemasons to Opus Dei, it's all demonstrable work. So if you have a dispute with the monastic order, the problem would be all of them think that what we are doing is right. And the church is unfolding into that, what you call it, the final, uh, you know, the absolute uh, manifestation of God's kingdom on earth, which you play in the gates. And that is the, 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 the I would in general, is a curl that, that the most important point in your world, the difference is between Espatol and Fellows, so that uh, how you think. And, and in, in accord with that, I mean, that, that how you, observe the system philosophy. I mean, how you, I mean, the philosophy becomes a, a system uh, with Hegel and Kant, mainly, and uh, how Schelling uh, 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 somehow um, uh, uh, creating a complete uh, antithesis of that to the eschaton. So the ecstasy of reason and, uh, uh, and, and, and many other things. So, uh, 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 I, th I think that um, uh, uh, this uncertainty of Christophon, 
So, I mean, of course, you, in your discourse, it is more philosophical or philosophical, theological. But how can this uh, reflected in the ordinary practices of Christianity, of, of any religion, as it? So that's what I'm very much interested in. Not just that it is being disputed uh, in the theological seminars, but uh, how uh, uh, that, uh, in fact, uh, there is a, a, a clear reflection on our day-to-day existence. <coughs> And finally, um, so I would say, I mean, I'm quoting from the from the 17 from the book of history. And he said that the morality signalizes the phenomenon and makes it non-identical to the concept. Very important observation. So there, the Hegelian and the uh, the telling, uh, you know, the position reality from the kind of confrontation. So this is very important point. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I have, uh, first of all, thank you for your commentary. Thank you many ideas, sir. My question is based on three points which you mentioned in your question. First is, you say freedom. Freedom from religion, freedom through religion, and freedom to religion. And second, phrase was anti-Christ and third was a life like method. God is here and Christ man is here. And then Christ even that is just mixing the two, just a balance between two. So my question is that from the early beginning you say that earlier preference was given to religion. That is why Nietzsche has said that God is dead. But he never said Christ is dead. And then we come to the books, whether it is by Bible or that Quran and any other books. And, but in today's time, more preference is given to myth. Like we are having good essay in the Victorian era, that is ideal verse. If we go with Ambedkar, he is saying religion is bad. But Buddha, that myth of Buddha is good. So in today's time, if we look at in Indian context, we find that religion is different, but preference is given to myth, whether it is cow and any other. So how selling is relevant in Indian case when religion or religious books are poor standard by the way. Thank you. So I take Babu's question as a comment. No? So I will not respond to it apart from that. I like this idea of uh, non-identical and the language in relation to the non-identical. This I don't know if we are contributors or not. It's very close to selling. So think of uh, the non-identical. To uh, come to uh, uh, Franson, the next question, maybe I have not met, either I have not met, uh, you know, clear to myself in the book, or you have not said properly, maybe uh, one of these two. In fact, I am trying to change that political theology is what I have written that you using not so much amphibolism, but destitution. So it's a destitution, and destitution of attributes, predicates, and so on and so forth. I'm trying to think uh, in polite sense of emphasis. Um, you am emptying, God emptying out on the cross. Right? Uh, so I'm trying to show that how the very same kenosis uh, 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 also operates in a different way in Hegelian thought. In fact, Hegelian theology of history is based upon but it's, I was trying to say that how uh, the concept of the canosis, the idea of the canosis operates in two different ways in selling and in having. Uh, where I'm trying to think canosis in terms of restitution. Uh, you know? So it is no way it has to do with uh, Pakistan. It is precisely to think of non Pakistan, non, non power. That's what. Uh, and moreover, secondly, that it is not theology as theology, I'm not big theology. Uh, I'm not uh, also putting myself as theology. And even Salim doesn't know that. Therefore, he makes all the distinctions. He makes that what he's trying to do is different from theosophy. He's trying to, uh, his, uh, what he's trying to do is different from mysticism. So there are so many different terms that he distinguishes theosophy, mysticism, theology. And he calls it in a very enigmatic way, metaphysical and basic. That is what also I like to do. You know, it's, it's a philosophical problem. I believe that as a philosopher, uh, uh, but using theology doesn't mean it in a big way. So it's not a theological 
theology. In fact, the whole problem is to problematize theology. Today's, today's world, what is theology? Where is theology? Everything is theology apart from theology. You see? The, the most theological problem in today's world is money. Money, economy is theology. This is what uh, provides big response to Karsman. That in today's world, everything is theological, apart from theology itself. So the theology may be the most theological theology. Uh, now the God dying on the cross, either you can say it is the end of theology, but if we follow people like Mortman, that's why they will say it may be the beginning of theology. A new theology will come. It is a, a, a theology that deals with the most ethological problem, that is God dying on the cross. What else can be more ethological than God dying on the cross? Either theology stops there, or a new theology begins. It's up to you. How can you think about it? For Moltmann, it's possible to think of theology. Uh, to be a theologian, at the same time, think of a theology within theology. This is very, very interesting. One of the great books in theology is by someone called uh, Eberhard Gundel. He was a professor of theology, systematic theology in the University of Tübingen. And just as this problem, it says the end of God, and then so and so forth. It's a very, very complex problem. Uh, maybe what I'm doing is a theological theology. Maybe that's the way to put it. So it's not a theologian theology. Second, uh, third thing is that uh, anyone who reads the, uh, anyone who needs telling today has to read Heidegger. You cannot escape Heidegger. Heidegger is the first person to break, uh, uh, decisively put Schelling in a new, new field. But I do not follow Heidegger. I, I have to cross to Heidegger anyway. And everybody has to put, uh, pass to Heidegger. So it's a kind of threshold point which one passes through and then goes somewhere else. I'm sure Heidegger will not like this as kind of that. <laughs> That's what I said. Heidegger will completely reject it. At the same time, I take up also in a interesting level as he good beyond being. Uh, this is a platonic idea, good beyond being. And reading Shelley platonically against new, uh, new platonics, against Plotinus, against the theory of animation and so on and so forth. But again, you see, I somehow cannot happen to be happen to belong to a school of thought. That's it. I cannot be Heidegger, I cannot be Levinasian, I cannot be the Soviet. It's all fine, but anyway, one has to think. One has to take responsibility for one's own voice. And that has to say also this. That's my, uh, that, that's the risk that one has to one day to undertake. So, I uh, sorry, I just yeah. The hybrid frame of uh, temporality in terms of the reason the official action of the official The frame of temporality seems to be foregone. But whereas my hunch is that in the frame of how that bothers Chilling and not the frame of temporality. And in that frame of how, Chilling is on the side of and people, we can ask for that one thing about the people who are more from the Republic. And that frame is what uh, Levinas bring forth against Canada. And that's what sort of he bring forth. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, all these things are there in your work, passive uh, people, and so on. And so on. But somehow, in a more major firm, major frame of Canada seems to predominate. In, uh, in favor of or against the minor frame of the questioning of Kutushaka, uh, sorry, Ha, which is expressed by the word Kutushaka, and uh, of course, and its sexuality, which is without the Ha, you know, which is not just so that opposition, I'm, I'm trying to make it by the opposition. Where, I think, what, where does one take the position? That to me is things I mean, I know so little of Shelley, I can only ask. I'm just not interested in problem of time, I, I'm interested in problem of event. Mm -hmm. I see, and event in relation to freedom. Mm -hmm. I, selling decisive, 
team that runs throughout all these worlds, is the question of freedom. The freedom of breaking through. Exactly. I mean, you have to bring back the idea. Yeah. So, even to not. Yeah. So, freedom of breaking through and freedom of breaking apart. You know, the moment you introduce the question of event like that, then the idea of the possibility of otherwise than what has been. This is also a kind of medical contingency that erupts. So, in the last work, it's a very complicated argument. Leading the tragic, uh, tragedy of Oedipus Rex, leading the earlier Selimian interpretation of Oedipus Rex, I was trying to show them how in, uh, in Selimian reading of Oedipus Rex, there is a thinking of coincidence of the opposites. Radical contingency. Radical contingency of having to be, having, uh, having to arrive something which is otherwise than what has already been. This contingency, which is which is opened up by radical abyss of freedom, which depends out any normotetic operation, because all the normotetic hegemonic operation is based upon the idea that uh, uh, what it is based upon the idea that it eternally circles, it can eternally circle in black back itself. See, like the logic of potencies, just like the, uh, I also use Benjamin, you know, you slap and the, the law slaps back. So violence and then against violence, against violence, law positive violence, law preserving violence. So the circle returns. It's called magic violence. The eternal love, the return of the positing and against positing, counter positing. Static violence. Static and counter static is still violent. So, magic violence. You have to break that cycle. What breaks that cycle? The possibility of radical contingency of something that can happen, something which is completely heterogeneous to what has already been, but which is precisely denied by the normotetic order of the law. And this is what weakens sovereignty. This is what weakens Pakistan. And this is the idea of tragic. Ah, because first of all, what what freedom? You were mentioning freedom. So freedom from religion, freedom to religion. And second, also in these days when myth seems to have overtaken religion, while religion indeed could be at a departure from myth, but how much in actuality? So once again, we are back to that religion question, which was raised very early in the Dharma question. Thereafter, by uh, his name probably is Dharma. No, I forgot your name. Dharmaraj. So Dharmaraj raised away the religion question. Uday raised the religion question. Francis and Babu also raised the religion question. And in a way, Deepa kind of, in that cycle that you were talking about, it brought us back there. That in actuality, in these days, is there a danger in positing religion as a possible tool? Because what freedom, reason, and religion are we seeking? And how much can we indeed, in these times especially, dissociate religion from myth in the way it is practiced, in the actuality of practice? And so, you know, that is the crux of the process. Just precisely with the political theology. Yes, yes. Religion has been used. All the time it is used, and it is also used. Uh, but then the, one uh, determines religion as myth. So, the question is to interrupt. Interrupt that mythic foundation of uh, politics. That's so that's why we need political change. That's why we need Senate. Because, because of the political use of it. Uh, in that way, I, it's, it's, it's to, uh, to slide in a uh, uh, response to uh, uh, France also. For Levinas, polit uh, ethics surpasses politics. You see, and uh, we went that not so in a, in a very minimal way, not like strong Levinasian way. But Derrida also thinks of ethics surpassing politics. Uh, I'm trying to think whether uh, I can think of religion like that. For me the question of religion will remain important. Because I uh, uh, I think that we need to think of 
uh, a relationship without a relationship which is not mere human activity. In other words, to think outside the legitimacy of the human. Uh, that is what is what has to be an important for me. So in that way, I, I need to think of my personal constituents of opening up of politics to something that goes to politics, but it is always I'm competitively calling the religion, but I'm going to talk about religious religion. Yes. Yes. Oh, right. Circularly so, coming back to the whole question, yes, yes. We, we can have this as well as the Maintains a certain in the European countries, and therefore it's quite strong in the countries. 
as a distinct form of uh, society and politics. The problem and if there is a lot of what is going on in the form of uh, a classroom form of interrogation uh, and so on, uh, in from confession and so on. But, uh, so there are a lot of those things that are meeting. So to rule that they are completely disappeared, uh, is this still form? It's not a content. Yeah, I, 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 I think because this is a cool very serious debate. You know, the time to turn it is not. Even, 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 yeah. even the analysis is not. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. All of you, yeah, I, I understand the trend of the argument. Yeah. I mean, but you will say, in essence, that the form, the, the, the forms themselves have deep religious yeah. roots, yeah. and historically, this can be shown that there are fantastic works which do. Yeah. Nevertheless, in that sense, I follow Marx that the diagnosis of a crisis must be made in terms of its structure and not its genealogy. Yeah. So the genealogy will always be something which will give you a perspective on the crisis. That I agree with you, that's a logic. But that does not mean that the structure of the crisis, which is a relatively historical imminent uh, task, can be confused with its genealogical perspectives or its genealogical perspectives. To that extent, capitalism and Christianity do not, in that sense, replicate the same structure. They do have. And, you know, it is on Bain's book, which says that the world became Christian with the very conversion of Constantine. That kind of long duration is there. But the world became Christian. And capitalism, in a sense, is included in the world becoming Christian. So that in itself has a certain validity, but at a different level. What we are talking about is something very conjunctural and very structural, and that needs to be taken on its own terms. Religion is sometimes a diversion. That's fine.